Hello, fellow gamers. Today, we're going to do something interesting, and we're just going to see how this goes. I call this uh, Duo DM, or Duo d and uh, and otherwise known as um, Gaming with the Misses. Um, me and my wife, or my wife and I, however you want to say that, we've been gaming together for quite some time. In fact, it's our house became the hub of playing with several people, and... Um, this quarantine's really put a kibosh on the whole thing. And we've been playing Roll20. I've been DMing on that. It's been fun. We're kind of going back. We're obviously playing White Star and uh, several other different games. And we're kind of, um, we want to roll dice and we want to sit and kind of, I don't know, have a bowl of chips and have a good time. Fortunately, when we do a Roll20, she's in one room. I got to be in the other because of the feedback. It's all kind of weird. So one night we decided, I said, let's try an experiment. We're going to do a, a hex crawl. I've never done one. I want to do it. I found one accidentally when I was looking for something for a ship battle thing. And uh, she was all in. She was dying to play. And uh, so we gamed. And for a two-hour session, we, it ended past midnight. She doesn't really stay up past midnight. She's exhausted by the end. We had so many funny laughs and good time. I'm going to show us a little bit of how we did it, okay? And a lot of people want to know, you know, how, how you do things or different methods. And people, we, we all search for ways. You could do this individually, an individual hex cross. You could do a solo, right? But me and her, we just switch off the game plan as far as who's DMing. So I, I did it, and then after I did my little stint, I gave it all to her. She went, we went back and forth. So this proved to be kind of fun. I didn't know it would be like this. It's still unexpected. It's a build-yourself adventure, and um, I totally loved it. We had the best time. So I'm going to actually um, take you where my slides are. I like to do slides separate. You can watch this video. If you want to go back and reference things, you can go to my webpage, drduick.com. Click on the Akasahedron right here. And I'm going to scroll down here. We're in the white box category. And after he says so D&D, these are the instructions for how we did duo D&D. <laughs> you like that? Kind of fun, right? It's also the hex crawl. So I'm going to take you through this thing. And it's got a bright, beautiful color here. Um, this is our two players, uh, also, always, also known as Gaming with the Misses. So this is her. She's got, I don't know, this is pink, red. I don't know, I'm colorblind. But I like cheese dice because I can see them easily from across the room. So all my dice I like is this very bright yellow looking stuff, right? And so this is my first attempt at a hex crawl, and I was, I was thoroughly impressed with the whole idea of how it works, okay? So this is our elaborate gaming setup. Okay, I, I did stage the shot, I'm not going to lie to you, but we did have about all these things out. I have uh, a giant picture frame, I already talked to my other one, um, that I glued to the back of a piece of uh, plywood that's my big rolling dice tray for my giant dice. Usually enemies have giant dice, and the players have the smaller dice. We have these trays, we got, I think we got them off eBay or something, they're beautiful. I, I forgot the name of the place that makes them, I, I, I can put it in the thing. But I, I'm a pipe smoker. I go out and here's a bunch of pipe tins. I keep all my stuff in from characters. And I have them in an array. I'm going to go through each one of these things. Um, and this is our four by six character cards. And this is what we're going to be using. All right. And I'll talk more about this and where you can get this. So we're using White Box. And uh, this was by Charlie Mason. He rewrote it. This is originally with Matt Finch. Or actually, originally, originally Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, right? And um, the white box is a beautiful game you could play. Obviously, you don't have to do big character development. I mean, the characters change depending on what it is. We had a great time. And um, these things are so god awful cheap. I, I gave a couple of them out. One my son has, and the, I gave some to, to some other people too. But for around four bucks a piece, you could buy a slew of these and go into a school and sit down and like teach people things. The other thing I want to tell you, it's a buy and a half, are the uh, basic fantasy. You could easily put them into any OS our, our game. Uh, since I do white backs, I changed the hit dice from 1d8 to to uh, 1d6, and all the damages are 1d6. I, I do 1d6 because it's so much e easier, and you'll see why, all right? So I'm blowing this up to make it look even prettier. I just like the shot. My God, this is a beautiful book. He uh, he added like you know characters like the paladin and the ranger and the stuff that you you know has swashbuckler. These are all fun things. So if you if you want, I, I would. It's a great investment if you're into it. I also wanted the hardback version of the book. Um, this is pretty, and the reason why it's pretty because I'm colorblind, and because they did these two in black and white. I guess there might be a color. I don't know, and it doesn't matter to me. I, I intentionally buy it. That's the reason why I like the earlier versions of Advanced D&D. All the pictures were in black and white. And how that, like, like a woodcuts or something like that. It was so beautiful looking um, and scary. And I, I just like that. I, I guess for someone who doesn't see color, it just has an appeal to it. So this is Jurg, right, or, or Megan. Uh, she always dresses like this constantly around the house. So I think I'm 
gaming with Trinity from the Matrix, right? Um, that's another shot. I just found it and I just put it in there as a joke. We're going to do the same setup I show on my other things where you have, um, once again, these are hit points and these are arrows. We loaded our characters up with 40 arrows. So there's going to be 20 on us and then we have 20 in the pack in the back. And she's got her special dice tray. I think that was a birthday present. And um, her rose pink, I don't call her his dice set. And we'll talk more about these character cards. I'll blow them up. Here I am. I am going to be called Stormbringer, right? And I have the same exact stuff she has. I got a notepad. We can write stuff down, move it back and forth. I use the cheese dice or the yellow dice so I can see my stuff because I, I, I think it's laboratory yellow when I was working in the lab during my, my, during my PhD. I, I loved laboratory yellow. And for some reason, it stuck out for me. So I just constantly buy these things. I have, a, I have a big set too, right? So this is my nerd picture. I found, actually, my mom found this. It's funny as this may seem. This is me. I was 13 years old. And I have my first D&D uh, game set. And this is the Tom Mulvey basic D&D. I cut so many lawns to get the advanced D&D books and I just bought stuff lazy, crazy, crazy, crazy back in the day. And then my, uh, my brother lost all my stuff because that's what they do, right? Yep. So look at our character cards. They're very simple. Keep in mind, we rolled them right then and there. I think maybe 20 minutes we spent building our characters. Uh, we did uh, naturally 3D6 straight down. And um, geez, I was sort of very lucky that day. I don't know how I was so lucky. And um, normally you don't have scores like this. It's just crazy when you think about it. And uh, we, we kind of keep it very easy. Uh, if the higher of the decks, that guy goes first. There's only two of us playing, so it doesn't really matter, right? You put all your junk on the back that you have, and um, we actually have more here because this is after the session. I got some really, really cool Holy Chalice of Tear that was basically able to give us, like, hit points and stuff. And I, I count the stuff on the back. We use the, the count. And you can look at my cards. I explain how these things work in detail. So I'm not going to belabor that right here. Um, moving on. This is our, our gaming mat. It is actually just a transparency cover, and that's a piece of wrapping paper. And I took like um, a manila envelope and just cut it to make it fit and just wrap the, the paper around it. So you can still see the lines for the wrap paper on the other side, but it's perfect squares when it squares. So your, your minis fit on there really nice. I, we did at the time use the little pawns, but you don't have to if you have the Magic the Gathering spin down counters which uh, if you have them, they're great because they could save you from writing down hit points and all that. And that's the stuff that you kind of like, I don't want to write all this down. It's this way you don't have to, right? That's why I'm using the spin down timers or spin down counters for all these things. Um, here's my horde of NPCs. We didn't really get through them all. In fact, I think we ran into a farmer. I didn't really take a picture of what we did because it's just me acting like a dork. So I just kind of grabbed uh, one of these dudes and pretended that he was a farmer in one of our discussions that you'll see coming up. But there's nice to have a bunch of guys sitting on hand so they're not monsters, which would be either the spin down counters or, or pawns that you actually get like a little guy I talked to. The, the wise sage in the back, he's, he's, a, he's, a show, he's a show a lot of times. This is my monster pit, I guess for dice. I use these giant dice for these things. And as you, you're gonna see when I do the game out, how these things actually work. But you just roll them, and then when you and you look at them, they kind of really target a whole lot different. This is a crit thing. If if you ever want to do that, I, I didn't use it, but I, I, it's fun if you have a group of people, and that's kind of what they're into. I just said max damage. If they're dead, it's not going to matter. But if they don't die from a from a crit, then you can say, well, they lost a leg or something. And these are a, a big thing of the uh, Magic the Gathering uh, spin down counters, which is very useful. Here's your sixes and your d20s, which come useful. So this is what we look at. This is a uh, Stormbringer. Okay, he's, he's got dual swords. He looks cool. And then this is York over here. And this is an idea of how you would set up if you have encounters and you want to use the pawns. They're all numbered, so you can have a sheet. And usually when I'm playing with a, one of my bigger groups, I number all my little pawns. They're little wooden guys I got on eBay. And I, I don't have a whole lot of mini for the bad guys because I ain't got the money for it. I'd rather buy it in the books, right? So all these little guys, I mean, I do have a, a couple really cool villains. Obviously, Strad, when I did, did um. Curse of Strahd, and I got some guy called the Red Jester who shows up and says bad jokes or politically incorrect jokes and, you know, torments the crowd. He's another guy that shows up, but most of the time, I'm going to use these pawny looking things for things, right? Um, and the spin down counters work fantastic because you have the hit points sitting on the front of these things. And I do low level games. I mean, you could do high level games. It just seems like I, I, I get bored with the combat 
either you know either you're fighting or you're winning or if you have like 80 hit points you're, it takes forever to knock somebody down so we I, the lower level thing is just my thing it, whatever works for you i guess if you wanted to have a bigger one you could have two counters for each one and do a spin down thing and then you could do maximum damage but in the end i really do i, I like to keep things moving into the next thing and that's how we play so i'm going to show you where i got this this is in the heart of the unknown uh, and it's by somebody called the Goblin's Henchman. And I searched for, I don't know how long, trying to find out what is this guy's real name. I don't know. But he is a creative genius. He has all these hex things. His website is loaded. So if you go to his website, it's called the Goblin's Henchman, you'll see all these things this guy creates. I don't know, who is this person? It's driving me crazy. So if you go through Drive Through RPG, he puts it all out there and it's just pay as you want. Or he puts them up his website, you can allow them from there. And he explains how the hex flower works. So if you've never used one, which I haven't, I've always found it intimidating because uh, some of the games I got with Matt Finch, like for example, I got Cyclopean Deep. He has everything like a, a hex map for some of his underground moving. And, and I always thought it's like such OISR thing. I, I would never get it. It's a little before my time. I guess I started playing back in 81. Or, so I guess they get it even earlier. Now. I have no idea, right? I was a young kid. But doing it is sort of fun. It really is write your own story, which is kind of cool. But it, if you're doing it like we were doing it, it was like sort of fun because it, it doesn't put the burden all in one person of prepping a whole bunch of stuff. You just go back and forth and you, you have a good time. So it's just a, a neat way of doing it, right? So how this navigates, and he explains it um, very well. And actually is in the heart of the sea, he explains it. But it's simple. You just kind of, uh, you roll 2d6, and let's say I start at the bottom. And all the numbers tell you which way to go, right? There's usually a stop on one of these, like you can't keep going forward, right? But if you fall off the hex, you just turn around and come back on the other side. You fall off the hex, you come back and go around the other side. You get, it's really cool. I did. I never really played it. And so that's when he came up with these hex flower things. I, I'm totally impressed. I, it takes, sometimes it's the whole idea of gaming. Obviously I'm showing all these different ways to play either with roll 20 on solo or solo by yourself. And now we're doing duo. I, I, I'm in the mechanics of the game, I find fascinating. I look at different things like even Mothership, how that's using percentile dice for things. It's fascinating to me. I just think it's cool how people think of things because it's just really neat. And this is, I'm just very impressed. I would love to meet this person, right? So here's one. Uh, this is from In the Heart of the Sea. I have it labeled down here. This is a much nicer way of explaining the whole thing if you didn't understand what I'm saying, but imagine you start in the center and you roll 2d6 and that determines the direction you go. and so the next time you roll, let's say, a, a, a two or a three, you would now move back up into this hex. So you just stop, stop. You're just jumping through this whole thing. And it's really, it looks more complicated than it really is. It's super fun. So I'm going to show you how we played it because we did reverse direction, okay? In, in the actual sheet, I'm going to scroll back up and show this to you because if I'm right. It says you found the encounter, terrain, then weather. So me and her talked over. So let's do weather first, then the terrain, and decide what we see in there, right? And so the honors task of trying to come up with a storyline is, is on both partners, but whoever's doing the range first, come up with their ordeal, and then the other person takes it and keeps going with the story. So it's, it's, really, it's a really cool collaborative storytelling technique, right? So I, I rolled a 10, okay? And so this is the uh, 2d6. So it means I'm gonna land up in this hex because it says I have to start from the bottom of. So I jumped into here. And according to this little picture, I kind of decided what that was. I said, well, it, it's a Sunday day with occasional clouds. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think when we played this, she actually rolled the dice and I just determined what the dice said. Now I think about it, I'm gonna change that right now. And that was fun because she's rolling the dice and I'm reading what's happening because of the dice roll and then vice versa. So I'm just gonna leave it at that and then you guys know what we're doing. So first off, it's a sunny day with occasional clouds. Another dice roll is made, right? So this is an 11. So, oh my God. So now we're looking at the terrain engine. It moves. So I'm just saying, well, it's the plains. It's grasslands, area and windy. And I add a whole bunch to it. I say, and you can look out upon the plains. You can see the clouds just flowing. Right? It's the almost most peaceful setting. You can feel the wind blowing through you and it smells so fresh. And now and then you get the whiff of like, uh, when it, when it feels very earth tone, very earthy. And now and then you see these rolling. I mean, we're, you know, you're having fun with this. You think about it, you're writing a story, you're having a good time, right? And then you would turn around and roll for the encounter. Since we rolled, I, I guess I, she rolled a six, right? It means we stay, stay at our spot. Okay, so now I'm gonna start like ad living because I have to do the encounter part. And I would say, um, uh, I said, you run into a farm settlement and then I took a little guy out. We started playing the farmer bit. So I started kind of going through the whole thing and she had to role play her character, which 
is a Swedish dude, which was sort of funny, and um, who likes to rub himself down with olive oil. Winter, it, it was a really kind of weird, now I think about it, it was really strange, but it was so much fun. Um, and this goes on for quite some time, and then he says that he keeps hearing and things out across the land that's actually doing something and pinching. He saw some farm animals dead. We're just kind of going with this whole thing as a great turn. And then I switch, and it's your turn. So she takes over at this point, right? So then the weather condition changes, right? So she starts talking about it's starting to get cloudier and darker in the afternoons. And so, so we did a morning stint, and this is the afternoon stint. So she's like, oh, it's getting cloudy and things are getting overcast. And then she talks about the terrain. So she rolled it, actually sent us back the other direction. We're still back in. We didn't go into the desert area or whatever this is, right? Approaching the desert. So this is like a 50-50 terrain. So it's half, half desert, half plain. So it goes back to the plain area. And she goes, we're still like walking around the plain, looking for the next thing. And the idea is to get somewhat to the center. The center, well, I'll talk about that at the end, what you would do, right? And eventually she rolled for the encounter. And all of a sudden that pushes us due north here. And it's a dinosaur. Uh, so it, when we look it up on the chart, it says it's a wandering monster, okay? Now, the cool thing about his uh, hex flower encounter engine is that depending on where you go, you would add stuff, right? So um, if you're on the plains or wherever you're gonna be, obviously uh, in this case, I put the, the, yeah, if it's a plane type situation, we go back up to here, right? He's in the, we're back here in the plains. It doesn't matter. I think I put the circle in the wrong spot here. I'll change it. Um, look at this. It says you get a plus two on your roll. You roll a D6 and a D10, and then check out what it says in the encounter, right? So we went down here and sure enough, I rolled a five and a one, which gave me a six. Yeah, two to it, it's an eight. So this is uh, the thing, it's all on that one sheet. So I'm gonna scroll back up, don't get dizzy, right? Look at this. So it's all on this one sheet. There's no second sheet. This is the coolest thing. And when you're playing this way, obviously you're having fun. You know, we spent a good you know, 20 minutes making the characters, laughing about that. And then all of a sudden we're into this thing for an extra hour and 10 minutes, hour, 20 minutes. And this was, this was a fun evening together. I'm just can't stress it more, right? So then we look down there, oh my God, we're into the bandits, okay? So she's doing the part of the bandit, and then this time she says, okay, she's going to do the dice roll, she rolled a 1d6, there's five bandits, they're about 30 feet up ahead, and she decides, you can see them, they're pulling out their bows. Ah, all right, someone's gonna pick a fight, let's go for it. So using our technique, which is like Swords of Wizardry, all right, our version of it, um, we both, we roll, one set of dice for both of us. So Jurgen Stormbringer are going to win this initiative, right? So uh, this is, I'm now showing the gaming technique we use, right? Now, so we're using bows, bows in um, Swords of Wizardry, or even White Box, they get a rate of fire of two. I remember all the way through Advanced D&D, &D, and then you get up into uh, 5e, I was like, why don't you get two shots? Uh, whatever, anyways, um, so this is the roles we have. Now, this is because of their strengths and, and they get bonuses, especially with dexterity and stuff. I, it's Swords of Wizardry, and especially six Swords of Wizardry Complete, it really says that their strength bonuses for to hit, we still applied them, all right, to them. Every little bit counts when you're this weak. When you're first level, everything will kill you, right? So once again, you watch what happens. This one plugs for six. This one plugs for uh, max. Max is at sixes, right, with the arrow here, right? Actually, it's not... Um, it's not 20, it's not a crit, but it's 20, it's a five, so you add one to it, that's six. So we have colored dice for her that kind of match together, and mine are kind of matching together, they're still yellow. So you can roll them all at the same time, we don't have to fight over who's did what, right? This one's a more rounded dice, and this one's more rounded, so you can see these go to, I, these look the same color to me, I can't tell. So basically, it's a very straightforward kind of way of playing. When it maxes, uh, and this is why I have this up here. I immediately get the full hit points, which is seven plus one. I mean, six plus one, which is seven. And it's going to take this guy out. Now, I, I've taught her many times in gaming that you shoot for the same guy twice, right? You know, you don't shoot for this guy and shoot for this guy because in, in case it does not that much damage, the second one, if you're able to hit him, takes him out. You want to reduce your numbers or you're going to get clobbered, right? So this was kind of a, a fun way. I, I'm just illustrating what we did. And... Uh, th these guys were whacked, right? So I just kind of put gravestones on them to let you know they, they were killed, right? So this is our arrow counters. Now, I thought I'd show you. So we both use two arrows, so we spin down our counters. So I, I spin down from 20 to 18, and she does too as well. Now, the magic, the gathering token things that you see right there, um, they have this really weird symbols for 20s, but you figured that out. This is the reason why we like to do it, is that we don't have to keep erasing and, and doing stuff on our sheet. At the end of the night, we just do a count. That's all we're gonna do. So that's kind of what we did, which was sort of a fun way of doing it. I, I just kind of came up with this because I'm 
gets interested in things like this, right? So they got to fight back. So they get the second turn, they're going to fire on this and they get the big dice. So I just put the tray down here so you can see it. So a 19 and a one, that guy's going to tag. This looks like me. Yeah, it's Stormringer. And this one down here, it's a 10 and a four. So you're looking at this, um, this one's going to miss. And it looks like uh, these two shots, this is on this guy. So they're both shooting twice, right? They got, so these are bandits. His two shots, only one's going to hit. And these two shots, both of them miss, right? So I'm okay uh, to some degree. I only got one hit point of damage taken on me. And then this one's going to fire twice on her. And this one's going to be a hit for four hit points. Right? So I'm just kind of illustrating how we played this. So here's our trackers. And this is what I'm showing you. I lost one hit point, And she's going to lose four. So we just spin them down. It's a really nice way of kind of playing the game like this, okay? And, all right, I'm going to grab this. My, my mouse isn't working. So the next round, the bandits are going to win initiative. Oh, no. Okay, so now we're, we're at 30 feet. We just say, now you're in melee. We, I, I don't really count, like, movement that much because that's uh, some level of the minutia I don't really care about. So so they're going to come up and start hacking on us, right? So um, then it's once again, it's just rolls. One, two, three, four. So of the three of us, uh, of the three hits, that is, only one of them's going to land. It's going to knock me for three, right? Now, I want to say one thing is I actually started with 21 hit points. So I it doesn't really spin down. I had to keep track of the fact that one hit point's not going to make my, my timer go down. So it's just kind of mental math right there. That's kind of easy, right? So this time I'm going to spin down three. She doesn't even get hit, right? Or, or Yurk, he doesn't get hit. So he's all right, right? So then uh, there, it's our turn to do the hitting, Okay. So I'm going to whack and say there are, I guess the armor class in this whole thing was about 13. Uh, I hit, I'm going to strike for, and I'm going to get four. I'm going to knock him out. And of course, she's going to knock this guy out. And of course, they're both dead. So now we're into the last phase of our battle, right? And uh, we got the initiative. Now, in, in our game, we play flanking. Anytime I'm engaging someone, I consider he's engaged me head on. So when she goes to strike, she's going to get a bonus because she's coming from the side when he's engaging me head on, right? I think in 5e, you sort of kind of do something that's like roll with advantage, you roll two dice. We, we don't do it, we just add to um, to the actual roll. So it's kind of, unless you, you know, it's kind of the way we do it. So once again, five, I, I, this is horror, I nerfed it, I screwed it up. But her on the other hand, she gets uh, 11 plus three, gives it 14, so that's gonna definitely tag him. And then uh, she does five hit points of damage, getting rid of that guy, right? So uh, he's dead. There we go. Nice to see, right? So that she's still DMing this. The, the, the mechanics of the fight, we do it together, right? But um, I decide I'm going to go ahead and bind our my wounds, our wounds. Both characters are binding wounds. And uh, heal for one, six hit points in. We're going to search the bodies for the loot. And she determines what the treasure is. And we roll for... Uh, hit points and healing at that point in time, all right? So, so like I said, she still, she has to make these decisions. There's a kind of a treasure chart, and a treasure chart in the back of the book. We decide what, what these guys would have on them, right? So then we kind of go through the next phase and it's the same, right? So, okay, then it's my turn to DM, right? So now we're back to here and, da, 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 and we determine where we go and what happens. And this one I'm trying to show you is that when you get to the one in the maze in the center, you got to have something to do and somewhere to go, right? So what we did, Okay, uh, as uh, there's a wonderful collection of books. I, I say anything that's cheap. <laughs> and if you're doing this, like I, I, I like, like I said, Swords of Wizardry, I pretty much bought almost everything they put out there because it, it's the Smith binding, it's all stitched in, it's so beautiful. But um, I love their books, but these books are so much fun because if you open them up and look inside, they have like a little boxes for hit points, you can cross things out. But uh, these two things are phenomenal because they're just really small, little tiny dungeon dungeons and you know little tiny excursions you can use and easily flip into the chart okay so they're super cheap you get them on amazon and then basically you can scratch through them and draw on the maps you're sitting there you know me and them are sitting through this and it's it's and you can actually get them for free if you wanted to just to basically i believe it's worth the four bucks to get a printed version that way you just have it and you could flip through them real quick find the one you want and start using it instead of trying to print something out there on the spot so this was my very, very quick, you know, very excited rundown on how we did duo D&D. &D. Um, I would love if you left some comments and talked about it and, and, and tell me how you, you guys like to play. I think this way it kind of takes the pressure off one person always running that helm of actually being the dungeon master. And it was refreshing for me because I usually am the dungeon master. It was great having her tag team it because 
everyone's got a story to tell. Everyone can be funny. Just give a little chance. And I guess with this one, it takes the pressure off. Oh, I got to do the whole thing myself. No. And this way, it's still fresh. It's, 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 it's hidden the adventure to some degree of what's going on. When we do the, uh, the actual walk through the actual, this part right here, that one we still do. Yeah, one person kind of running it, you could do it that way. Or I like to do it like it just kind of reveals as it goes. Let them make the decision, but both you guys fight, you know, kind of thing. You could, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Okay. With that, I want you guys to have an excellent day and thank you so much for listening and uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>